Now, I was telling the truth. Um, I honestly don't know what is in the gifts, and it may actually be a cheese slicer. You know, but, but I'm going to ask, course, now, now, I don't know if everyone has a different gift, you know, so, so we have to be a little careful here. Um, but there's probably a lot of uh, conversation that just happened in the last 30 minutes. I mean, I was part of a, of a number of them, um, and it is just exciting to think about the amount of change that is going on in the industry and how, um, if, we, if, we, if we went back to one of our conferences in Beijing, you know, it was interesting. You know, people weren't really thinking about all this data and all the connected devices. And, you know, people were wondering, like, well, all the cost of connecting all these things, who's going to pay for that? And that was like the debate. You know, and now it's almost a foregone conclusion that we're going to see this. We can clearly see the volumes of devices out there that are connected, and we are definitely going to be deluged in data. And the question is, what do we do with all that data? It was kind of interesting. I was with a uh, CIO from a uh, white goods manufacturer, refrigerators, washing machines, and he said, now if all these devices connect, I'm going to have 70 million appliances talking to me. That's not what I do. <laughs> and how often are they going to want to send stuff to my data center? I, that's, not how I, that's not what I work with today. And so a lot of people, not only the CIOs, but I think the business people are wondering, how do I get value out of the data? What's it going to look like? So we're going to talk about that right now. And I'm going to introduce Stephen Sitt. Stephen is the program director of IBM's uh, Silicon Valley R&D Lab, where, he, where the uh, IBM's big data platform is developed and engineered. Uh, Stephen holds a bachelor's and a master's in computer science. Uh, he and his team help IBM's customers and partners evaluate, prototype, and implement big data solutions, as well as build big data deployment platforms. For the past 17 years, Stephen has held key positions in a number of IBM projects, including business intelligence, database tooling, and tech search. And early in his career, Stephen was a developer and software architect in, in Lotus and IBM services divisions. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Sitt to the stage. All right, can you hear me? Good afternoon. It's very good to be here today. I'm very happy in seeing all of you. And uh, as, as Bruce said, I have a R&D background. And I came from uh, uh, Silicon Valley, which is uh, north, uh, north part of California, as you know. So in the past, I would say, five years, there has been a lot of very good, very exciting innovations. Some of those are driven by, uh, in the big data area, and some of those are driven by companies uh, such as Google, Yahoo, and you know, eBay, and, 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 and so on. And some of it are driven by uh, more enterprise-oriented uh, 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 companies like IBM and Intel and so on. So we, uh, in the Bay Area, actually, we have a fairly significant footprint on R&D. Uh, we have a lot of uh, development teams as well as uh, research uh, staff has been working on big data-related technologies for quite a while. And for the past three years, we, my team has been really focusing on how do we actually bring these technologies and apply them to solve real enterprise big data problems? And even though I'm part of the engineering team, but my, I, myself and also my uh, immediate team is actually working directly with customers, help solve their problems, and we bring the experience back to the R&D lab so that we can continuously have this feedback loop and enhance the product capabilities that I have. So in today's talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first go over our definition or our understanding of, of big data and why is that apply to not only the, you know, the pioneers in the, in the internet-based companies, but also to the enterprises like, like yourself. And also going through some real uh, use cases scenarios based on the experience that we have in the past couple of years. And then at the end of this discussion or this talk, I would focus more on introducing the uh, big data platform capabilities that's coming out from uh, from our portfolio. So those are basically the three parts of my uh, uh, presentation here. So this is a chart that many of you probably are very familiar with. You've seen different versions of this. This is talking about, you know, everyone is talking about big data, but where is actually the big data are coming from? Where are they being generated, right? So our view on this one is typically you can divide it up into two uh, uh, segments. One is the data that's coming from the 
the, the new class of applications that are primarily driven by the web. Right? These are the social media, these are the broad different forums, and, and so on. And many of these, as you know, are generating terabytes of, tens of terabytes of data every day, like Google and uh, Facebook and, 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 and Twitter and so on. But that's not the only definition of big data, obviously. We talk about big data very much so in the data that's being generated behind the company's firewall. Right? All, all of the applications that's driven now by the smart devices, the cell phones, uh, you have a lot of uh, RFIDs out there, smart device sensors are being generated by equipment. And all of these machines or smart devices are generating even more data and more rapidly within the company's firewall. So this is, I like this chart a lot. This is actually seeing that, visualizing where the big data exposure problem is. As you can see that, you know, we are here in 2012, and with the data exposure projection, by 2015, there will be more than 15 zettabytes of data in the GOP, and just how much of 15 zettabytes, right? So if you imagine that you put a data in the DVD, which holds about six, uh, six gig of data, you can stack them up, and it, it goes halfway from the Earth to the Mars. That's how much uh, 15 zettabytes of data is. A couple of very interesting aspects about this data. Volume is obviously one of them. But look at the different sources. There are going to be a lot more of a variety of different sources that's generating all of these data. The traditional uh, data that's coming from your ERP system, CRMs, and, and operational databases obviously is, is growing as well. And there's a lot of regulations out there talking about keeping those data longer. right? So that's, that's one, obviously one source of data exposure. But look at the new sources of data, the voice over IP data, the sensor data the mass amount of social media data that I just mentioned about today, th those, are, those are existing, but companies are not necessarily leveraging them and translating them into uh, business intelligence. The other very interesting aspect is when you look at the, the new sources of data, especially related to sensor and machine-generated data, the velocity of data that's coming into the system is, is, is very, very uh, quick. And a lot of times, the, the insight that's embedded in this data has a very short lifespan, meaning that if you use the traditional approach and wait for your monthly reports or weekly reports, by the time you get the information, the, the meaningful of that information is probably already lost. So when we talk about big data, in, set, uh, in addition to volume, velocity and variety is also a very key. But I think you probably heard about this, this, this three values, uh, three Vs, as, what, you, as what, what, what we said. But the other very interesting definition that we came up recently is called veracity, right? which to us is actually an even more uh, uh, interesting aspect. Veracity means the data that carries a certain amount of, of uncertainties. And if you look at the data, we believe that over 80% of the data in the new big data source are actually uncertain data. Okay, and what does that mean, right? The information from social media, for example, a lot of time, it carries the aspect of a positive or negative sentiment. Just an example of that. That itself is actually uncertain data, because there's a lot of belief that if you're just looking at it narrowly on certain things, certain products, certain customer categories, then the sentiment may not be a true representation of what it is, because typically, people are making a comment on the social media is unhappy customers. A lot of happy customers, they wouldn't even bother to, to do so. Right? So you have to really look at things in context. Another example from a machine data standpoint is call data records. This is very popular in, uh, in, in the telco industry. If you look at individual call data records, the call could be perfectly fine. Start time, how long the duration happened, and it and ended uh, uh, perfectly. But if you look at all these data itself, it, in, in, in context, in the longer duration, you might actually find out that there's many of short calls happening in a, in a minute or so, or in a, in a few minutes, and that means that your customer is actually having a bad job call experience, and they're making a connection again and again. Right? So that's what we call the, the uncertainty of data. The technology challenge, obviously, is on not only process the huge amount of data, able to deal with the velocity of data, but also the ability to able to determine the minimal insights from uncertainty data. So that is really the key. So what has changed right, in the past couple of years from the technology standpoint that actually make big data possible? So certainly, there's a couple of things. At the very fundamental level, uh, certainly, as we all know, the, the cost of hardware 
uh, especially uh, storage, has been driven down significantly. Right? So finally, it, is, it makes economical sense to actually for companies to store data, mass amount of that, for longer duration, where previously they had to throw them away because it's too costly to actually store them from an infrastructure standpoint. But that's not the end of it. Just able to store big data without analyzing it obviously doesn't mean anything to the, to, 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 to the companies. So there are very key innovations, and I would say that the most significant innov innovation in this area from an analytics standpoint is, first of all, the ability to do very complex natural language processing able to understand you know, the most commonly or the latest way of expressing some ideas, right? So people, for example, in the internet is using all kinds of short forms when they're typing short messages. And as you know, Twitter is all limited to very short messages. So conventional nat natural language processing needs to be enhanced to be able to deal with this new way of natural language processing. The other way is it needs to be specialized. You need to understand domain-specific meanings, right? So that's one area is about understand the unstructured data, understand natural, natural language processing capabilities. The second one is, how do we actually process this mass amount of machine data and able to shrink that down into, into meaningful insight through the analysis, we call the machine learning, and also determining correlations uh, about the data, right? So that's, uh, uh, I think Horace showed uh, very good examples of you know, actually what we call as data scientists able to look at the data and really transform them into insights by finding out different correlations uh, in the different data sets. So from a technology standpoint, those are, are, are very challenging. And innovation, for example, the uh, 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 IBM's Watson technology is a, is, is a very good example in that, where it takes mass amount of data, including, but most primarily, unstructured data, able to process them and, and build this knowledge base and the knowledge base can feed a front-end engine, which can, can be used in, in, in question-answering scenarios. Right? So that's a very good showcase about the technology. The other one, from machine data uh, analytics standpoint, we like to bring this example up quite a bit because it's a, you know, it's, it's a capability that we're involved with the hospital in, 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 in Canada, but also it has is a scenario about saving life. So it's, a, it's actually a very good uh, uh, example that we're very proud of. What it is, is from the medical equipment standpoint in the, uh, in the intensive, intensive care units for uh, immature babies. Um, the doctors in the hospital actually use sensor data. They actually attach the sensor and capturing the data into the data center for building up models which can detect uh, um, a complication such as a, a infection in the premature babies, right? So if you look at this problem, actually it's a fairly big problem, right? Because on average, the hospital, we have roughly 100, 120 babies, and we are capturing uh, quite a bit. It's about uh, 120,000 messages per second. So every single day, the data center is receiving about a billion messages, and all of these needs to be analyzed and correlated in real time on, with the database or knowledge base that's been built before with medical data, and, 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 and predict uh, the complications as quickly as possible so that the nurse and the doctor has time to, to react to the situation. And so we've proven the technology that we can detect. Using this technology, the doctors can detect the complications such as infection 24 hours ahead of time. So obviously that means saving life, but also shorter state in the, uh, in, in, in the ICU, which would cut, up, cut down the medical cost by quite a bit. So obviously, I gave two examples. One is more on the uh, text analytics on the Watson technology that, we, uh, that we're leveraging. The other one is on sensor-related data. So that's, I would say, a little bit more academic. So I would like to focus back on what is the, you know, in the industry, especially in the private sectors, what's people's view on leveraging big data? This survey actually just came out very recently. It just came out last week. Uh, is a survey that we conducted with a partnership uh, with the Oxford University and the business school there. The, the interesting thing here is, in the past few years, we've been actually working with almost 300 customers out there, and the experience that we are gaining from working with customers directly match quite well with this independent study that we uh, 
partnered with the, uh, with the university. So I give you some highlight. This is actually a very deep study that you can find uh, on the IBM website. It's a very interesting read. But I took three data points to give you some highlight about this study. The first one is a survey on what is, why big data is relevant and important for the enterprise. So um, this is you know, basically the same thing as what we heard from, the, uh, from, 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 from larger enterprise, is that they view that big data is nothing but maintain competitiveness against their competitors, right? What they're telling us is that in many different eras in computing for the past decades, for example, e-commerce, it is actually not that hard for them to put up a website and start you know, make, making the, you know, the, the, the fulfillment process and all of that, the inventory control, all of that uh, as, as the support and in the front end to provide a new uh, commerce experience for their, for their customers. If they're behind on that, it's naturally not that significant because they can catch up quickly and the consumers basically can strip because that's the nature of the web. Today I shop here, Tomorrow, if I shop there, it's a similar or better experience, I will switch, not, big, not that big a problem. But what they're seeing is that the fundamental driver for big data now is all about brand recognition, all about the image about their enterprises from their consumers, and all about their ability to actually innovate and improve their products. And those two areas, if they're behind, against their competitors, it takes years, years to, to actually catch up. So that's the main dri driver, and as you can see that, this is what we heard from the customers, and as you can see from the survey result, there's a significant jump, a 70% jump from the, from, from, from the people that were answering the question is, is that big data equals to maintaining competitiveness. And in fact, I should mention that this survey is done uh, on about uh, over 10,000, uh, no, actually 1,100, uh, uh, customers over 70 countries, so it's a fairly good uh, representation. So that's on the first one. The second one is really do a survey on where, where customers, where enterprises are with the big data cycle. So as you can see here, it is still getting started. So a lot of customers or enterprises out there are actually in the stage of uh, studying and also planning for big data activities, so close to 50% uh, of the companies are doing that. Only 24% of are in, in the state that they're just, you know, they're not planning to do anything with big data. But the interesting point here is close to 30% of the enterprises there already has big data, either in the pilot projects or in actually production mode and able to drive value out of these projects. So I found that's interesting. But the other one actually is a drilling down into what are the key activities, right, on these big data pilots. And as you can see, Almost 50% of the pilot projects on big, the, big data has to do with gaining consumer insight, customer insight, customer-centric analysis. And the second category, which is close to uh, uh, 20% or 18% specifically, has to do of how to leverage big data to improve internal operations and product innovation cycles. So those two, I think, it match also very well with what Bruce uh, uh, mentioned earlier about collecting all the data, but you need to start analyzing it. And at the top of that cycle is really about understanding your customer better, innovate better, and serve them better, right? So from here, I'd like to talk about realizing that, talk about uh, a few cases that, uh, 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 that we've been working with. And in fact, we, uh, as I mentioned, we've been working with almost 300 customers uh, worldwide in the past couple of years. So we have quite a bit of these uh, uh, reference cases, but I, I, I took a few which is more relevant to, uh, to this industry here. The first one is actually Cisco, uh, which they are our reference uh, partners about uh, almost two years ago. And this is a unit actually in the, uh, a new business unit in, in United Kingdom. And what they do is they leverage technology in Cisco, but they built the uh, smart sensors that's being used in the, uh, uh, what they call the, you know, the smart buildings. So it's Sensors attached to everywhere in different type of rooms and collecting data in real time about the, 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 uh, the, the, the temperature, the, you know, the lighting situations, uh, and, and so on, and feed them all into a data center again. And the analytics will be built to really find out the, the, the consumption model and divide it up into different type of building, different type of uh, rooms, 
and also compare that in, uh, in real time and historically against the, uh, the policy that's been set, energy consumption policy, being set on the buildings and re able to find out the anomalies. So this, uh, this is basically the, uh, the, the, the main driving force for the use case, but we also been working with Cisco in terms of you know, when they setting up uh, all of these infrastructures to collect the, the, the information in build time and actually setting the energy uh, in the building, they're very worried about the reliability of this, especially in the application that they're running in their data center. So they have been using big data technology to actually collect uh, the log being generated at all level uh, in the data center, including the, you know, the networking, including the, uh, the switches, uh, the, 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 the servers, the, the software that's running on them, collecting logs in all different levels and analyzing them and finding out using big data technologies to find out what are the most commonly uh, 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 common failure patterns, right? And use those in their monitoring systems to make their, you know, we call it IT to IT, to make their infrastructure more reliable for their customers. Telco is, is, a, is you know, basically a, a big domain for big data, primarily because there's really no shortage of, uh, of big data. As I mentioned earlier, uh, call data records, they're in, the, uh, in a typical uh, telecommunication uh, company is about you know, somewhere between 10 to 15 billions of CDR records uh, being generated every day. And to extend, extend to that, there's not only CDRs, but also IPDRs, MDRs. There are many, many uh, different records uh, also being tracked to understand or capture the, the activities, not only at the voice, uh, consumption, but also in the data consumption for, uh, for the smartphones. So we have technology there to help the telcos to capture uh, these technology from the switches and able to do transformation, we call it data mediation and the data deduplication capabilities, quickly finding out the, you know, the, the job cost situation that their customer may have, feed that into their CRM system so the next time when the customer call in, their reps already know there's a job cost situation for that customer for that region, and it will be the take step to maintain their customers as quickly as possible. So that's one area that we started with the telco companies, but they're coming up with a lot more scenarios based on the requirements from their other departments. So in, in many cases, for example, the, uh, the, the customer relationship and sales department will also come into the picture to say, how do I use data to actually uh, predict the terms of my customer? Because as you know, uh, I think Horace mentioned that also in the U.S. that you know the people owning smart devices pretty much saturated. So maintaining the customer base uh, uh, and preventing them from from you know jumping ship from one company to another is, is very very key for these telco. So having the data, as I mentioned, especially the data that's being captured to understand the the, the user behavior at the content access level. That's one dimension being be, being leveraged. The other dimension is to understand uh, inject the the customer's demographic information, such as their location, their income, and, and, and customer profile, using these as new variables and fuse them with the traditional source of, of transactional record like CDR and, 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 and analyze them together and determine the most commonly behavior for their customers before an actual, actual uh, a retention issue, issue actually happens. Right? So this is really about you know, trying to find out you know, two weeks or 10 days or, 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 or one week before their customer may actually make a, you know, make a movement to their competitors, capture that because that's the only time frame that can allow their sales or customer service department to, or marketing department to make an offer to the, to, to the customer and try to retain them. So those are very interesting cases that we're seeing from, uh, from telecommunication. And the other industry, obviously, uh, is semiconductor. And you know, there's no shortage of data, again, just like, just like telcos. And we've been working with a couple of them and also with the IBM uh, uh, internal facilities in, in Poughkeepsie, basically uh, using the, the data that are generated by these uh, devices, right, fabrication devices, uh, they're attached to, the, to, to, to all the equipments. There are hundreds of these in the typical um, uh, assembly lines, and each are generating, uh, you know, uh, 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 thousands of thousands of, of, of messages in real time, capture all of them, able to predict, first of all, uh, the yield, but also more importantly, to really find out the error conditions in, 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 in these devices and able to fine tune them as quickly as possible be, uh, you know, before the raw materials is being wasted. 
Uh, another area is actually leveraging big data to do uh, image processing. So this is actually also a very interesting case. We're partnering with a province in, uh, uh, in, in, in China. This is a case there, there that in, 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 in many situations currently in China, that the, the hospital in, in major cities are very well trained, that the doctors in the hospital are very well trained. Uh, but when, when you go down to the, uh, uh, to, you know, to the, to, to the raw area, uh, the second, second tier of, uh, of hospitals, the doctors there are much less trained. So typically what happens is there's a lot of patients that needs to uh, actually visit the, uh, the, the hospitals in, in, in the cities and always the, uh, generating a lot of traffic and overloading the major, major hospitals. So what we're doing there is trying to have these kiosks which allowing the patients to actually take major readings like uh, you know, x-rays, and MRIs, and things like that. And without them uh, visiting the major hospitals, these kiosks would be able to submit these Im uh, images into a central called a crowd, medical crowd environment. And then having the system doing categorization as much as possible, right, based on historical image that has been analyzed, and, 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 and categorize them so that it saves time for the, for the doctors in main hospital that they can come in and do distant uh, diagnostics on, on, on uh, major disease, and then, and then we're able to feed back to the, uh, to the people that are providing these images. So this, is, this work is uh, also very, very interesting. So hopefully I give you a kind of a general, general feeling of how big data, how companies are, being, uh, are using or leveraging big data. In terms of leveraging uh, uh, unstructured data, leveraging social media data particularly, this is actually a very good example. This is about the using real-time and historical trend analysis on social media data and really determine the, the effectiveness of, of the advertisements that companies are doing on TV this, in this particular case. And as you know, in, in, in many of the cases, I believe is, is especially true in, in consumer products, company is spending huge amount of budgets, right? We just, Horace just mentioned about 10 billion that Samsung is spending on, on doing advertisements and so on. So it's very, very important that the, the marketing department is getting this feedback, um, whether, whether these, these uh, uh, advertisements are useful or not. That's obviously one, but the other one is it needs to have the insights to really figure out if there's an issue with their advertisements. It needs to have actions to understand it enough so, so, so it, can, it can take corrective improving actions. So this project particularly is we're monitoring um, uh, the, the advertisements based on normal TV shows, TV times, and providing the trend analysis there, but also uh, in special events, such as in Super Bowl uh, in the US. Companies spend huge amount of money doing special advertisements in those, in, in, in those period of time. So we are capturing the sentiments in real time uh, during these special events and also compare them to the sentiments we got in the normal TV time and really find out the differences. But as I said, understanding just the general sentiment, the general buzz, you know, all of these analysis is actually not enough. In this case, what we're trying to do is to build the customer profile that actually are making those comments about their advertisements and providing the next level down of details of why there's a positive or a negative sentiment. In those charts here, it's probably very hard to read, but basically it's the, what we call the micro-segmentation on the, uh, 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 the, the actual analysis, such as when people are making a negative, uh, negative comment, uh, what are the percentage that the, you know, the female is making it versus the male, what part of the advertisement that they actually do not, do not like, these are very important because typically the advertisement companies, they have production crews that they can react and rework on the advertisements very, very quickly. But they need to have this level of information so that the insight can actually be insightable, actionable. So this is basically a highlights about the, the capability. This is actually internally in our lab. We're running a, 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 you know, what we call a 360 degree uh, customer profiling capabilities just based on this sample set of data in traders, we were able to actually build about 30 million users constantly in, 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 in our lab and figuring out these people are making, a, making certain comments on product services, but what are the different profiles that, 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 that come with them? For example, uh, you know, they're life-changing events, right? Are these people actually just have a newborn baby or they're you know, about to move from one city to another city? Those are all the information or the knowledge base that we can say to build based on the individual level. Uh, do they have an intention to actually purchase 
uh, a certain product or services. Uh, those are all the information. So imagine this information would be very, very valuable for companies. For example, when, 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 when a, a person is actually, or family is actually moving uh, from one city to another, that's the most critical time from a customer retention standpoint. And if, customer, if companies know that ahead of time, they can come up with special offerings to actually retain uh, those valuable customers that they have. So I want to switch gear a little bit. I talk about the, uh, you know, where the trends actually coming from. I talk about the uh, uh, customer use cases, some examples that we have. Uh, so at this stage, probably the question is, you know, what are the capabilities that I actually need uh, so that I can leverage uh, you know, the big data and so also uh, materialize some of the examples that I gave earlier. So when we look at the big data uh, from a platform perspective, we really think that these are the areas that are really, really important, right? So first of all, obviously, with all these three Vs or four Vs of data, you need the capability to be able to, to, to inject them into a common, common area and able to manage them. So injection and management, obviously, the first step. And as the data are being, being brought in, you want to be able to react to it and able to run some real-time analytics. So that's one, the first aspect of that. But just able to store this mass amount of data in the repos big data repository doesn't really mean too much. You have to be able to analyze it. So events analytics in a very scalable form, both from an unstructured data standpoint, but also from a machine data, a structured data standpoint, is very, very important. Uh, that can be run in a scalable, scalable way uh, on this data that you're capturing and store. As you're analyzing the data, especially for big data, you need to have new ways to actually visualize um, uh, data sets. So there's a lot of innovations in terms of how do I actually analyze the different relationships, how do I find the correlations between different data sets. Uh, these are not conventional uh, type of graph. You know, a lot of these, these things have, have very, uh, uh, a new way of actually analyzing the data. So that's typically a new set of tools that we're providing to uh, what we refer to as the data scientists, which typically is a subject area experts, uh, but also has a technical uh, uh, business sense as well. The other very key uh, important area that we have is when we talk about big data, we really do not want big data to be a new silo uh, in the organization. So what we mean is that the big data needs to deliver value and deliver new applications to the line of businesses. So in order to do that, the IT department will need to have uh, the same set of tools that they are, they are familiar with so that they can actually develop these uh, 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 new applications and able to deploy them to their business users with the interface that they actually, the business user is actually familiar with. And then the last thing is very obviously any, any applications uh, that's been deployed into a production environment needs to be manageable, needs to have the security uh, uh, um, Need, uh, meet the security levels, need to have the governance surrounding it, uh, need to also to be a, a, a high performance. So this is actually the big data platform that we launched about two years ago. And I'll go through that uh, very quickly here. So we have in the big data platform uh, what we call a set of big data engines. So the first part of big data engine is uh, based on um, open source Hadoop which is you know, a lot of very good innovation that's happening around that. The second part of the big data engine is, is for real-time analytics, right? And this is actually a partnership that we, uh, we did with the US government shortly after 9-11 uh, uh, to actually uh, uh, detect terrorist activities uh, in real time. And in 2005, we started prioritizing that as a capability called Stream Real-Time Analytics. The third area is for data that is highly condensed uh, in the warehouse form that, re that can drive uh, data marts and data warehouse applications. And in this space, we've acquired a company called Natiza about two years ago, and we're uh, coming up, a la launching a new set of uh, data warehousing appliance, and we, uh, the, the latest name, we call it uh, Pure Data. And the last one has to do with unstructured text, uh, data discovery, facet discovery, indexing capability, and search capabilities. And that is an uh, acquisition that we just did very recently, about four months ago, of a company called Avissimo. So those are the big data engines, but to make it work in the enterprise, obviously we need to have the in integration capabilities, making sure that all of these engines are talking e to each other, highly integrated with each other, but also providing the capability like metadata management, like security and governance, very important. 
And in addition to that, well, we also find out that the, you know, many cases, we, we, we looked at the percent, percentage earlier, where the customer, from the starting point of getting a big data environment to the point that is actually delivering a, a, a return on investment of value for their line of business. So this point A to point B gap, sometime for big data is relatively long. And the reason of that, for that is obviously that you know, the technology is still relatively new. So what we're trying to do in this space is we're coming up with a new set of specific accelerators. Some of those are industry specific. Some of those are, 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 are horizontal from an industry standpoint, really trying to help our customers to gain uh, uh, business value quicker from the big data technology. So in, later on this year, we're, we're launching a social data accelerator as well as a machine data uh, accelerator. And obviously on top of that, you need to have the new set of visualization tools, development tools, as well as system management tools. So I would, in the interest of time, I would skip the, uh, the technical detail here. So this actually is a, is a very interesting chart. Um, many people ask us, right, how do I actually get started with a big data project? I understand the value of the technology. Uh, you know, I understand my, you know, my, my IT department is also um, uh, uh, excited about getting started with some pilot projects on big data. How do I actually get started? And what we be finding out is that the most effective big data implementation is somewhat like this. So this is a marketing related chart, but I really kind of like it. Uh, it's really saying that typically to get a big data project really going and, and start getting business value quickly, really take a close partnership between the IT organization of the enterprise as well as with at least one or two line of businesses. The idea is to build this big data environment right, with, with a company-wide architecture and able to leverage existing data that's already there uh, in the enterprise, bring them in, but also inject the new sources that's available there from sensors, from the different devices, from social media, add them and fuse them together, analyze them together, and deliver value initially maybe to one or two line of businesses. But when, when the project is proven from a value standpoint, immediately what you want to do is to, to start working with other line of businesses and try to get the big data value more pervasive in the company. And we're seeing many of the pioneer the company in different industry, insurance and you know, uh, consumer products. This is exactly the footprint that, uh, uh, that they're following. So to sum up uh, here, so when our CEO uh, came on board, a new CEO came on board, she defined the three initiatives for the company. Right? One is on smart commerce, one is on cloud computing, and the other very major one is on uh, business uh, uh, analytic optimization, the BAOs. And obviously, BAO on big data is a, is a key area as well. So IBM is certainly committed in this area, and we're adding a lot of investments uh, in this space. And also, as Bruce mentioned, we, have, you know, we are the top in terms of the uh, 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 patents. And, and in the big data area, we also have a lot of uh, innovations in this space. And we're, doing, we're not doing this alone. So in the past less than two years, we've built an ecosystem of business partners worldwide. And this number is a little bit old. We have, I believe we have over 200 partners already. And it's a combination of uh, software vendors, uh, service providers, uh, system integrators, and so on. And this ecosystem is really he uh, healthy. And we, we, we're seeing a lot of partnership actually happening uh, uh, with customers together. So that's, uh, that's my talk, hopefully give you a high-level overview, and I'd like to take a couple questions if there is. Um, to do questions, and uh, so for all of you who have big data, deep big data questions, um, dinner and then tomorrow as well, uh, Steve will be here and be able to talk to you about that. Thank you very Sounds much. Good. Thank you.